Hello everybody and welcome back to Genome Toolkit Part 2. In this video, we're going to be adding our first function to our class. In our last video, we have created and set up our project. We created a base class and we imported that class into our application.py file right here, just to make sure that our class and the project works and is set up correctly. Our first function will be a very basic one. It will count repeating patterns, also known as kamers, in a DNA sequence. This algorithm can be solved in a quite a few ways. We are adding it to our Genome Toolkit class right after this initialization function. Let's take a look at this simplest approach first, which is going to be a for loop approach. So let's take a look at this function. I'm going to copy and paste it from my notes. Here it is. Let's actually remove this file list because we're not going to be adding new files. We don't need to look at that list and we have more space right here. So as you can see, this is a very generic, simple for loop and a function count kamer and it accepts three parameters. So the self is used within a class and not outside of the class. We don't need to pass anything into it. If you're not sure how this works yet, feel free to ignore it. We will come back to this in our future videos. And sequence and kamer are self-explanatory. So the sequence is of course a DNA or RNA sequence to search inside of, and kamer is a subsequence or a pattern to search for. Okay, so how do we run this? Let's create a test sequence first. We can create a sequence and a kamer. So before we even run this code, maybe we can do this by hand to predict the output that our function should return, okay? So we can see that in this sequence, we're gonna be looking for a kamer that has two nucleotides, okay? So also you will see that all of these ranges right here that use the length and minus one, they help us to make sure that no matter how long our sequence is, it will always work correctly. You will be able to play around with different sequences and different kamers when you write this function to test it and confirm that it works with a different length kamers and sequences, okay? So if we take this kamer, we can see that it appears in that sequence five times. So the first time is right here. The second one is here, it's overlapping, but it still counts, it overlaps. So we have three A's and they each share that middle A. So one, two, three, four, and five. Now, if we're gonna call the function from our class and pass the sequence in Kamer to it, we expect to see five. So let's do just that. We don't need to save the output, we can just test it by printing it out. And if we're going to say GT, because that's the class we created here, we want to use functionality called Kamer count from within our class. So we're going to say GT, which is genome toolkit for short dot. And you can see a lot of functionality within this class. All of the underscore ones here, they are built in functionality into the class. We don't need to worry about this. We only care about what we've added ourselves. So we can see the Kamer count function is listed. Let's call that. And we can see it auto completes for us, right? So it's asking for a sequence in the Kamer. So let's just do that. Let's say I'm going to pass this sequence and I'm going to pass that Kamer. And let's run our code. And we can see that the output is of course five, just like we predicted. If you look at this function, it's a very, very simple for loop. We use the range to make sure we never go over the length of that sequence right here. So we use a slice of that sequence and we compare it to a kamer. And the slice, of course, is two nucleotides long because our kamer is two nucleotides long and we use its length, okay? So one way to look at this as well is to visualize this. So this is what we're doing. We're taking a kamer of length two and we just keep scanning by two. And we can see that the matches come up here and that's how we get five because we have five matches. We will try visualizing our algorithms as much as we can. The above example is a very simple and easy to understand. More complex algorithms will definitely benefit from such a visualization. If you use a Python debugger and try looking inside of the function, you should be able to see something like what we see in this visualization. And it will look like this. We start from our sequence and we're comparing by two nucleotides, every single position. So we start with our sequence, we take first two characters and we compare them to the kamer. And if they match, we add one to our kamer count. And this is how you can easily also visualize on the piece of paper before you even start writing the algorithm. You write it up, you see what you want it to do, and then you try implementing that in Python, okay? 
So even though we looked at visualization and what to expect from this function, let's do a quick experiment. Let's use a debugger and actually get access to this function when it's being executed and look at every single step to confirm that our visualization of it actually is correct. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the breakpoint right at this line number eight. Here it is, red line. And what we can do is make sure you activate the file here, not this genome toolkit, but application.py. And we're going to run the debugger right now. Run, run debugger. So it executes our code and you can see it stops at this function. And we can say F11 or just this icon here, step into it. Now we are inside of this function and we can investigate every single step. So for simplicity's sake, I'm going to close all of this and just open the watch. What do we want to watch while we execute this function? We want to watch the slice that we're comparing. So I'm going to copy this piece of code here. This piece of code will give us a slice into a string. Okay. And I'm going to print out Kamer as well. So this way we can actually see what we're comparing to what. And let's print out the count on the fly as well. Okay. So now I'm going to make this a bit larger so we can track what is going on. So now let's use the step over functionality to go through every single step and see what's going on. Okay. So now we're going to enter the first slice. We can see that the first slice is AA and we're comparing it to AA. So the counter should increase and it does. Next one is also AA and we are in the position right here. That's the position right now. We can say that AA matches AA. We're going to increase our counter again. Now we are comparing AG, which is right here, AG. And of course it's not equal AA and we're not going to increase counter. Let's keep going. GA, AA, increase the counter. AA again, increase the counter. AA again, one last time, increase the counter. And you can predict that now it's going to be AT. We're going to go AT, does not match, TT doesn't match, TG doesn't match, and the last one is GA, and it doesn't match, and we're going to exit and return a number 5, and that's what we see here in the output, number 5. Okay, so yes, we have a function. We looked at the visualization you can do on a piece of paper or in the text editor. And you should also be, you know, trying to use a debugger because more complex functions, if something doesn't work, there's nothing better than firing up your debugger and looking at every single step of your function. And you're going to spot errors, mistakes right away that way. Okay, so this is a very basic but still very useful algorithm for biologists. It can be used as one of the steps in pattern search in genomes. If a genome subsequence, which is a KMR, is known, and biologists have a good understanding what this part of genome is responsible for, let's say it's a gene in a plant that is responsible for circadian rhythm, or a gene that codes for an eye color in some species. They can use this algorithm to search for patterns in genomes of other organisms and skip the slow manual work of searching for this pattern under the microscope. Biologists can just sequence a genome and run our code by specifying what pattern they are looking for. Of course, this is a simple and naive example, as we don't take into account many other biological concepts like SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms which will make this particular algorithm useless. That is why this algorithm is just one small piece in our toolkit. Only by combining many algorithms together, we can create something called a pipeline. Pipelines will allow us to connect multiple algorithms, each doing its own part, to produce the final result. So let's take a look at one of the pipeline examples. Each step out of five steps can be its own algorithm. So the first one could be search for a camera with a maximum hamming distance, set to 2 in a sequence A. Then we can generate a complementary sequence B from a sequence A. Then we can reverse the sequence B, which is just generating a reverse complement, so we can read that sequence from 5 prime end to 3 prime end. Search for a Kamer with maximum Hamming distance now in a sequence B, after we did that for sequence A. And then the fifth step could be collecting, displaying, creating a graph, or saving data into the file. So again, each step could be its own algorithm, and we're going to be adding these algorithms. And this is 
what is called a pipeline, okay? You would never really use a single algorithm in most of the cases. You would be combining them into a pipeline. Even though the for loop approach is very simple to write and understand, and it is beginner friendly, it might not be very fast when we need to search through a very long sequence. Imagine you have a 500,000 base pair long sequence, and you're searching not only for a single kamer, but for a kamer with up to X mutations. You could use a Hamming distance for that. This will add up very fast and make our for loop approach very, very slow. There are many other ways of solving this algorithm. We will take a look at one that is both faster and shorter solution in our next video. For now, see if you can figure out a better way of solving this algorithm yourself. When you are just starting with programming, there is absolutely no need to try solving any problem in a most efficient way. It will probably be impossible anyway. You will learn better ways as you progress. Having a very basic solution, like this for loop, that actually works and is easy to read and understand, is more important than having a solution that is convoluted, ambiguous, and is hard to maintain in the future. Try solving your algorithm in the most basic and clean way, and try improving on it only when you run into performance issues. This is what we're going to be doing in our series anyway. If you want to improve your Python code and be able to come up with more Pythonic and clean solutions, I definitely recommend a book called Effective Python, 90 Specific Ways to Write a Better Python. Okay, so this is it for this video. There's also an article available in the description below, and I hope you really enjoyed adding your first function, trying to visualize it, and also using a debugger to go through and see what's going on at every single step of that function. This is definitely something you should be practicing more. Visualizing first, trying to implement it. When you implement it, use a debugger to confirm that your design of your algorithm is correct. So this is just the beginning. We're going to be adding a lot of amazing functionality to our class and actually building a useful tool for bioinformaticians. Please make sure to check out the rebelscience.club website for article versions of this video and join our communities on Matrix and Telegram. Okay, until next time, Rebel Coder, signing out.